Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent-pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and welcome to Episode 4 of ADHD for Smartass Women. Today, I am going to speak about my experience with medication. Now, if you've been listening to my podcast, you know that my son was diagnosed with ADHD at 12, and then I was diagnosed eight months later. And when my son went through, and that was about mm, almost four years ago. Now, when my son went through his testing and diagnoses, the first thing that was recommended to us was medication. To be honest, it was literally the only thing. And we talked to my son, Marcus, about it, and we decided against it. You know, we didn't think his ADHD symptoms were that bad. And I just had issues with medicating a child who couldn't sit still and talked a lot and was really exuberant and excited. And, you know, maybe he could have done a little bit better in school as far as being more consistent, but it just didn't seem like those symptoms were enough to medicate him. And he wasn't really interested in it either. So we decided against it. Now, when I was diagnosed eight months later, it was the same thing, meaning medication was the only thing that was suggested, nothing else. And they put me on Adderall and I tried it. And I tried it partly because I thought if I can figure it out for myself, then maybe I can help my son. And, you know, just given DNA, if it works for me, perhaps it'll work for him. It didn't work for me. It made me really anxious, jittery, short and snippy, and even more unfocused than I was uh, without it. And certainly my brain was much foggier. But I have one of those personalities that when I decide that I'm going to try something, I am going to keep going until I figure it out. It's that persistence that a lot of us have, right? We're supposed to not follow through, but when there's something that we're really interested in, we bump or jump into that hyper-focus, and we are going to figure it out. So after Adderall, I tried Ritalin, and then they put me on Wellbutrin, and then they decided to try Stratera, and then there was Busbar and Lexapro and Focalin and every supplement that there was. I tried all those things too, and nothing worked. I experienced everything from seriously burning eyes to weight gain. Yeah, I'm probably the only person that is (laughs) put on medication for ADHD and I have to worry about weight gain. The worst part for me, though, was the anxiety. And, you know, I didn't have anxiety before. I mean, I always make jokes about I don't have anxiety. I cause anxiety in other people. (laughs) But... Since I was a kid, I've also, I've also always been very sensitive to caffeine and anything that messes with my hormones. So, for example, protein powder, birth control pills, bioidentical hormones, the paleo diet. I guess because, you know, you eat so much protein on a paleo diet, it increases your testosterone. And so I would just feel bloated and yucky. And I, I, where I really see these shifts and, I guess hormones is I break out. So in essence, the medication created many more problems um, than they solved. In fact, they really didn't solve anything. I, I didn't feel more focused on the medication. I felt less focused. And I think it was because of the anxiety that it caused. Now, my health insurance wouldn't allow me to do any testing. 
if I had to do it again today, I would have paid to get my DNA analyzed so that my doctor would have had a better understanding of what medication might work best for me based on my genetic makeup. And I still might do that. Otherwise, you know, you're just a giant experiment, just like our brains are all wired differently. You know, our bodies are all different. And so what works for one person doesn't work for everyone. And I guess for me, you know, I was such a tough case that I couldn't find anything, frankly, that worked. Now, several women on our Facebook group really recommend GeneSight for this uh, this testing. I've not used it, but um, I did go in and do some research, and it's, I think, $330, which is half of what it was four years ago when I initially looked into it. And I I didn't look into it until I had been through a lot of medication and and decided, you know what, I feel way worse on this stuff. I think I tried for a good two years. I feel way worse on this stuff than when I'm not on it. Okay, so let me tell you about my son's experience with medication then. So right before high school, he's now 16, he asked to try medication. I think he was thinking that he wanted to, you know, really be as focused and do as well as he could in school. He wasn't a bad student. He's actually a really bright kid, but his grades would fluctuate anywhere from A's to the occasional F. Like he was consistently inconsistent. So generally he would have a lot of B's, a few A's and a C sprinkled in. And, you know, he's he was really ambitious and really, you know, he had um, a lot of aspirations. And so, you know, he came to us and said, I want to try medication. So we went to his doctor. And of course, what they did was the same thing they did with me. They put him on Adderall. Nothing else. My son, however, is very unaffected by caffeine. And so and very unaffected by, you know, pretty much anything that we can figure out that he puts into his body. He has very strong likes and dislikes, but caffeine doesn't affect him at all. So I thought, well, maybe he'll be different than me and it'll actually work for him. And initially he thought it did, but his comment was he didn't really feel it at all. He didn't feel any differently on it. And so he he really didn't think anything of it. But I noticed that he started to get really irritable and he seemed kind of down. Now, keep in mind, he was a freshman in high school. He was also playing football, not something that I would allow today with <laughs> all the research on uh, on, on the brain and football. Um, and he had a really bad coach. And he's a very, he's a social justice kid. And he was so disgusted with this coach who consistently told the team, which was primarily comprised of at-risk kids, that the only way that they were going to go to college was through football. And so Marcus thought he was very abusive to, um, to the team. And so I thought that's what was going on. So Marcus was on Adderall for about three months. And one day I looked at him and he was so skinny and nervous and irritable. He was just a different kid. And I realized that he'd been on Adderall and it didn't help him with grades at all. It didn't make him a better student. I didn't feel like he was more focused and, you know, more consistent in in much of anything. I mean, granted, he was literally going to football practice six days a week. So he was getting a lot of exercise. And I just thought, you know, this isn't working. So I talked to him about it and we pulled him off of it. Now, several months ago, and this was a couple of years ago, he's now a junior. Several months ago, we were talking about, you know, his experience with Adderall. And he was telling me that he was really anxious and depressed during that period. And he started talking like, you know, maybe he was predisposed to depression. And that's when I, and I kind of thought, well, maybe he was too, but that's when we kind of put two and two together. And we realized that the depression he was experiencing was from the Adderall. It was after we took him off of the Adderall. So we took him off and um, a couple months ago, he was just retested. And so because he was now 16 and his last diagnosis was when he was 12, we wanted a really professional diagnosis. So I spent a lot of time finding a doctor who specialized in ADHD, who came highly referred. He's a really good doctor. But again, his doctor suggested that we, and, and of course he was diagnosed, you know, with ADHD again. His doctor suggested that we try medication once more. 
And his thought was, if he could figure out what medication works for him, then when he goes off to college, if he needs to, oh, I don't know, study for finals or, you know, write a paper, he can use the medication for those specific times. So Marcus went on a very low dose of Focalin. I think it was five milligrams. Again, I think Marcus is like me, where he is very affected by medication, even though he initially thought that he wasn't. The Focalin, though, was the first thing that he said he was on that he really didn't feel it at all. But again, it didn't do much of anything as far as his focus and his organization and his executive functioning skills. So, you know, our thought was, why be on it if, you know, granted, you don't feel bad when you're on it, but it's not helping you. Why be on it? So we took him off. So based on these two experiences, I have some... um real thoughts about medication. And I want to give credit to Dale Archer for this because he really helped me to come to the conclusions that I've come to. Now, Dale's a psychiatrist and he has ADHD. And so, as I've said before, I really value the opinion of doctors and other professionals who deal in ADHD who actually had ADHD. Dale's also, um, so he's the author of The ADHD Advantage, What You Thought Was a Diagnosis May Be Your Greatest Strength, and he also wrote Better Than Normal, which is a New York Times bestseller. And so this is where I come down on medication after my experiences. I'm not against medication in serious cases of ADHD. You know, I've heard incredible success stories um, with medication and around medication, like women who had, you know, a bunch of kids and they literally could not function and they now can, and they're actually functioning very well. I've also met many children whose self-esteem was so low because they knew they were so smart, but they couldn't get their work done and they were pulling C's and D's despite the fact that they were really trying. And then they would find a medication that worked for them and they became straight A students and they're so much happier and they're so much more confident. And we know based on a lot of studies that what really trips people up with ADHD, adults specifically, is not the symptoms of ADHD. It's more the abuse that they take or that they took from well-meaning parents and well-meaning teachers around the fact that they had ADHD. So if you can take a student who's, you know, really depressed and really anxious and feels is really lacking in self-confidence and with a medication can turn that all around where they're then pulling straight A's, straight A's and they can compete and they're, you know, much more confident and they're much happier. Then, of course, I think that, you know, medication should be something that um, that they try and that they use. There is also scientific evidence that when ADHD isn't treated with medication, you know, when you have, you know, a serious case of ADHD, your symptoms are serious, the chances of substance abuse increases. And that makes sense to me that when brain chemicals are low, we find a way to replace them. And I think that you really have to look at the individual person. You know, for me personally, and I believe for my son, we just don't have the propensity for addiction. And that might very well be why medication also doesn't work for us. However, I do think that we really have to pay attention, especially with kids, but also with us as adults, because we we have these kids on medication or we're on medication and it's actually making us a lot worse. But we forget it's like my son. Right. We forget what the normal was and we develop this new normal. And I think it can be really dangerous now. The first line of defense, what really bothers me is that the first line of defense is you get the ADHD diagnosis and you're handed a script and it's usually for Adderall or Ritalin. And this is all because, you know, a teacher couldn't handle your bright, inquisitive, energetic um, mind, which often comes with a bright, inquisitive, energetic body. You know, you were constantly interrupting. You couldn't sit still. You were bored and you were probably bored because... Frankly, your teacher was boring, right? And it's not just teachers, because if you're a great teacher, I personally believe you're in the most impactful, important career that there is. It's the system that teachers are required to teach within. And then you've got parents who are stressed out. And so what our society does is it looks for the quick fix, right? It's like, well, there's got to be a pill for that. There is such pressure to medicate. 
children. And I have heard of psychiatrists refusing to see patients if they're not on medication. I've also read so many stories of kids who were suicidal and on these meds. And, you know, initially I thought, oh, that's just the media hyping a story. But then I look at what happened to my son and he tells me today that, mom, you don't understand. I was seriously depressed and I didn't even realize how depressed I was. And no one checked on him, not his doctors. I didn't, you know, I didn't even I don't think Marcus even realized it until he was literally out of it. And I certainly didn't realize it until after he was out of it and he started talking about it. You know, I just thought, oh, he's a teenager. He's at a new school. You know, he doesn't like his football coach. Okay, what else can I say about this? So what worries me is, and I've heard this over and over again, you have doctors who know nothing about ADHD prescribing this medication and offering nothing else. And what I understand with doctors and medical school and ADHD is that most doctors get less than 30 minutes of training around ADHD. Psychiatrists today get almost no psychotherapy training in the residency programs. It's almost all psychopharmacology. And I also understand that years ago, this was split between 50-50, where you'd get psychotherapy training half the time and you'd get psychopharmacology training half of the time. And then, of course, there's the pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceutical companies who are making billions of dollars on these medications. And half of all kids who are diagnosed with ADHD are on medication. I think it's a third of adults as well. So, again, you're struggling. Here's a pill. And this is all sanctioned by the medical community. You know, we've pathologized everything. If you've got a problem, there's a drug for it. Now, I really respect Russell Barkley. You probably heard me speak about him before. I think he's one of the best ADHD experts out there. So when I was kind of researching medication, I went back to see what he thought about medication. Now, Russell Barkley is pro-medication for moderate to severe ADHD that impacts, you know, um, people's lives. He also believes that you should try other therapies first before medication. And I generally agree with everything Russell Barkley says, but then in a footnote, I saw that he's worked and works as a paid consultant to and speaker for a number of pharmaceutical companies. And that really worries me because we know that 90% of all the research on ADHD is done by pharmaceutical companies. And by the way, less than 1% of all that research is specific to women. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, apparently the pharmaceutical companies have corralled all the top researchers and doctors in the field, in the ADHD field. They pay them a ton of money and they reward them with consulting and speaking contracts. So then if you see research that's connected from these doctors, that's connected to Harvard and John Hopkins and Cal, I mean, what are you going to think? And, you know, when we're talking about stimulants, you know, stimulants pump up the heart rate. They stimulate the nervous system. And over time, I just have to believe that's got to also tax the nervous system. And so I'm worried about stimulants like Adderall and Ritalin and Vyvanse and Focalin because they definitely increased both my son and my anxiety. They caused depression in my son, you know, perhaps they did cause depression in me. I I don't know if it was that I was down because I was trying all these medications and nothing was working or was it actually the medication that was causing, you know, my feelings of um of being down. So they didn't have much benefit for my son or I. And I'm worried that these drugs over time, that they're going to alter the brain for good and actually decrease the amount of dopamine in the brain. So when my son got off Adderall, that's when the depression seemed to kick in. It wasn't so much when he was on it. When he was on it, I think it was more anxiety. And I'm now certain that Adderall was the cause of that depression. And it makes sense because What's happening when he got off of the drugs was that the drugs were used to prop up his dopamine. So when he got off the drugs, the dopamine, of course, was less. And so it makes sense that that's what would cause his depression. 
You know, I'm also totally against ADHD medication as the only resort. It bothers me that few doctors offer any other alternatives, like working on things that interest you, like alternative forms of education, like exercise and nature and building an accountability through structure. You know, for example, ADHDers do surprisingly well in the military. And when you think about it, it doesn't make sense. But then when you really kind of dissect it well in the military, there's high pressure, there's lots of physical activity, there's this intensity, there's this built in camaraderie. It kind of makes sense, right? And then my son, he did much better in a Catholic school. And I think it's because of the structure. You know, when he's at the private schools, or the public school where there is less structure and there's more a kind of, well, what he would say is kind of this loosey goosiness around education where a lot more goes. Um, there's a lot less structure. He just doesn't do very well. He's bright, but he's very disorganized. You know, his brain does not think linearly. So if everything around him can be linear, it really helps him to focus. It prevents him from spinning. It makes him more confident. He just needs to know what is it that I need to do exactly and when do I need to do it? You know, in the Catholic school, he's not able to get behind because he's not required to do as much of the scheduling and planning as much of the executive functioning, which, you know, those are the things that he struggles with. It's done for him. And I think that by forcing him to do that, it teaches him how to do it. The other thing that concerns me is that I don't know. I just, in a lot of ways, feel like people are medicating their uniqueness. And I think that that's exactly what happens with medication. We're suppressing our natural strengths so, so that we can fit into this box that society has deemed good and acceptable. And honestly, we're just bored. And what we need is to be challenged. We need to be excited. We need to be interested. I often say, you know, we're max in a PC driven world. We have a different operating system. And would you rather be a Mac that's innovative and creative and cutting edge? Or would you rather be a boring, safe, uninspired PC that runs off of Windows? And that's unfortunately what our schools and our corporations are designed to, to welcome. And so for those of us with ADHD, I think a lot of it is just changing our environment. Thankfully, with the Internet, that is happening even quicker than it was happening before. So if you're opting for medication, I also don't think you should be on it every day or with the idea that it will be forever. So we have this brilliantly creative woman in our ADHD Facebook group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, and she has been on Adderall and Wellbutrin for literally a a, a decade or longer. And she was ter she was feeling terrible and she joined our group and she decided she was going to get off of it all. And she told me that she feels so much better. So I think the big lesson there is pay attention to how you feel because a month can become a year and then it can become five years and then it can become a decade and suddenly it's a lifetime. And we develop these new normals. We forget how we felt before we are on medication. So I just believe that if you're opting for medication, don't take it every single day. You know, a lot of people will take medication on specific days. Let's say they know that there are things that they need to do and they need to get done. And there are things that they really struggle with, like their taxes or payroll or writing. It's very difficult for a lot of us with ADHD to write because it requires structure, right? It's point one, two, and three, and then items one, two, and three underneath each one of those points, and that can be difficult for us to do. So whenever you know that you need to do dull tasks, then you could, you know, if you know that you just can't get it done without medication, that would be a great time to me to pay, you know, to take medication. Pay attention to how you feel. I love this quote. I want to give you a quote from Dr. Archer. And what he says is, again, we must think of this as an allergy to boredom. So he's thinking of it, his ADHD as an allergy 
to boredom. The restlessness and inattention of the trade is often the result of being bored easily with routine. It's not a bad thing unless we insist on making a routine structured life for everyone mandatory. Some of our greatest business leaders have embraced their ADHD and refused to medicate their uniqueness. Imagine the loss to our culture and economy if these extraordinary individuals had surpassed their, ener- their restless energy with a pill. So this is what I think um, in a nutshell. Let me just recap. When you're trying to decide to medicate or not, check out all kinds of other options first. Not one doctor has ever suggested cognitive behavioral therapy, either to my son or me, and I believe it really works. For example, my son kept telling me he couldn't read. And I thought, well, it's that he doesn't like to read. And then finally he sat me down and said, no, you are not listening to me. I can't read. I will read a page over and over and over again. And I can't, I have no idea what it is that I'm reading. I can't focus enough long enough to actually make sense of what it is that I'm reading. So what did I do? I found him a reading specialist. And what she does is she uses metacognition, which is basically paying attention to what you're thinking while you're thinking. And she started to train Marcus in, you know, using metacognition. And what he realized is it's not that he can't read. It's that he can't focus on what he's reading. And it's because his brain is just focusing on all kinds of things other than what he's reading. So he is training his brain how to focus on what he's reading by paying attention to what he's thinking. So check out other options. Consider alternative schools, majors, jobs that are a better fit for your ADHD traits. Figure out where you really struggle and then considering, consider using medication to get those things done, like homework, like reading, like, you know, sitting in a meeting. God, I hate meetings. (laughs) What else can you do? Get a proper diagnosis from a doctor who specializes in ADHD first. I think that is hugely and critically important. Make sure that you actually do have ADHD and it is, you know, a, a serious case of ADHD. Take medication breaks, a weekend, vacations, holidays. Take those times off. Monitor yourself. Really pay attention to how you feel and make a point of writing it down because otherwise you're going to forget. So when I was doing my whole medication trials, I would literally put a spreadsheet together and come hell or high water, I filled it out and it was not easy for me. But I needed to have the symptoms all down there and then the dates. And so I could track and have a, you know, an overall picture long term. Okay. How was I feeling now versus how did I feel when I first started? The other thing that I would do if my son were to go back on medication ever again, myself too, I would take at least a two-week break from medications every year. For my son, I would never have him on medication during the summers, and I would not have him on medication during the holidays. Keep in mind, I do not, although they do say he does have, you know, a pretty He's got ADHD. There's no question about that as far as him being able to sit down and focus and pay attention in school. But what I have noticed with him is when he is interested, he goes down that rabbit hole and he is hyper focused like no other. He gets things done. However, I would take him off medication during the summer, take him off medication during the holidays. Bottom line, I think the most important thing you can do is listen to yourself first. Pay attention to how you feel. Monitor how you feel. Anyway, as always, you are listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like what you're hearing, I would so appreciate a review. If you have a comment, if you have a guest you'd like me to interview, or you have a topic idea that you, you know, please feel free to contact me. If you go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and click on podcast in the na- navigation bar, There's a microphone right there in the header. You can leave me an audio message. You can also reach out to me at Tracy at TracyOtsuka.com. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smartass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. 
Go look it up. We're a totally smart-ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.